Please take your Bibles and turn with me now, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. As you know, we are studying the ten plagues, and uh, we've gotten almost to the end. So far, we've studied blood and frogs and lice and flies and murrain and boils and hail and locusts, and we're in the middle of the darkness, hopefully as lights in the middle of the darkness, and coming soon, death for all of us, as well as for this planet. And so we've learned a budak, blowfro, lie fly, mubo, halo, and daddy. <laughs> you know, I'm going to give you all a test when we get through. Expect it. It will be a written exam, in fact. I think I'm going to pass out papers. And uh, no cheating. You can't ask your neighbor. You can't look over their shoulder. Uh, you'll have to be on your honor. I hope that you have honor and that you won't be looking like this off the side of your eye. And we're going to have you put your names on the paper. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, do you remember it? Blowfro, Lifefly, Mubo, Halo, and Daddy. And that should let you remember all ten plagues in order, and I hope as you remember the ten plagues, you will learn the lessons that God has taught us from the ten plagues because they are given to us all over Scripture to teach various lessons that God wants his people, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, as we see them repeated in the book of Revelation, lessons that he wants us to learn. We've compared these with the hospice care, those three last plagues, locusts, removal of all life-sustaining nourishment, darkness, shutting down of the organs, darkening of the eyes, mind, body, irreversible coma, and then, of course, the final termination, which is coming up, death. We've learned a lot of things about the plague of darkness. I'm just going to summarize them briefly for you today because we have a lot more that is still in the plague of darkness found in the New Testament, which we want to see today if we can. We saw that it's supernatural, tangible darkness that showed the presence of the Shekinah glory. We saw it's often associated with the Shekinah when God is about to judge. We saw that the principal god of Egypt, which was Ra, the sun god, was being judged by this particular plague. Each one of the plagues judges a different one of the Egyptian gods. The believer who's in fellowship with God does not need to fear what is in the darkness. David remembered the Exodus in Psalm 91 because he mentions this plague of darkness. The darkness contains fearful things. Unbelievers love darkness, and so God will give them darkness for all of eternity. Light versus darkness is one of the key motifs and themes of the Gospel of John. Remember the Gospels of John. I hope you remember that when you talk to people this week picking up some of these Gospels and talking to somebody about the Gospel of Christ. They are in darkness. This gives them light. That's one of the key motifs of the Gospel of John. I hope you use them this week. Deliverance from darkness is one of the primary illustrations of salvation in the Bible. In the Bible, darkness is a picture of spiritual blindness, filthy sin, and spiritual death. The removal of darkness by the Shekinah glory is one of the great messianic prophecies. Rejection of the light of Christ plunges a man into darkness. Darkness is a picture of the vanity of life without God. Darkness is a picture of judgment during the day of the Lord. The darkness in our text could be felt like water you feel when you're submerged. At the cutting of the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham himself felt the horror of great darkness, and then God revealed the Egyptian bondage to Abraham. There's a close connection between those two things and this plague. Because the very next plague is when God delivers his people. The devil is not the king of hell, even though hell is a real place and that is the heart-smoking darkness that is pictured for us as we look at this. It's a real place, a darkness, fire, torment, it lasts forever. The devil is not the king of hell, it's the place where he'll be punished. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. Hell is where the rebellious fallen angels, the demons, will spend eternity. Hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. Hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity, and it is totally dark, and it is horrifyingly hot. Then last week we learned additional things about darkness and hell. We saw that Jesus said, if you have no spiritual fruit in your life, it's proof that you're lost and headed for hell. We saw that Jesus talked more about hell than about heaven because he doesn't want you to go there. 
It should be obvious when all four Gospels record something, it's evident that God is making a point. And you recall that Jesus said a lot about hell, for example, just a few verses out of Matthew. All four Gospels contain verses like this. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. And he shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wherefore, if thy hand offend thee, or foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, halt, or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. But if you refuse Christ, that is where you also will end. The appearance of the Shekinah at the burning bush was a main key in Stephen's, Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. The Shekinah glory is seen in judgment in the doctrinal epistles in the New Testament. We saw a couple of verses on that. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice he said obey not the gospel, not just believe not the gospel? Because if you believe it, you will obey it. What you really believe changes your life. What you really believe does something to you. And that's why he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. We saw last week that our hoarded material possessions will be used in fiery judgment against us. The stuff that you hang on to here on earth will be used in judgment against you. Your gold and silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. A rather serious warning. The fire of the Shekinah will blaze and consume earth in the final judgment. But the heaven and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God's not going to destroy the earth again with the flood, but he's going to destroy it with fire. It says so in the Bible. 2 Peter 3.12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Sodomites are given as an illustration of the judgment of hellfire, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude 1.7. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But they can be saved. Paul says so over in 1 Corinthians. And Jude makes reference to it here in Jude 1.23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. The book of Revelation portrays Christ as the judge under the image of flaming fire. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Chapter 2, verse 18, under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. He's pictured there as judging. And you'll notice it's judging a church, the church at Thyatira. Chapter 8, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. We find many visible illustrations in the plagues of Revelation that warn the earth that hellfire is coming. The first angel sounded there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. It takes you back to the plagues again. And they were cast upon the earth and the third of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Verse 8, and the second angel sounded, and it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Takes you back to the plagues of Revelation, of, of Exodus. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and jathlins and brimstone. That's like molten lava. Can you imagine something wearing a breastplate of molten lava? And the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Fairly fearsome creature, if you picture it in your mind. By these three was a third part of men killed. By the fire and the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. If you add together all of the different judgments in the book of Revelation, you discover that over 50% of the earth's population is killed during the judgments of Revelation. Are there 8 billion people on the planet today? 4 billion people will die. Will die as a result of the judgments of the Great Tribulation. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Rainbow was upon his head. His face was, it were, the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. There are a lot of illustrations in the book of Revelation about the fire that's coming. 
Judgment fire is in the power of the two witnesses. We talked about them somewhat last week. During the great tribulation, Revelation 11, fire, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I think I mentioned last week that since these two witnesses have power over all plagues and can call down fire from heaven, they're probably Moses and Elijah. Verse 6 says, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. That's what Elijah did. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. That takes you back to the Exodus. And to smite the earth with all plagues. That takes you back to Exodus as often as they will. The false prophet uses deceitful imitations of God's judging fire to make the world worship the Antichrist. Revelation 13:13, 13, 13. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. You remember Janus and Jambres? Those were the two false prophets, the two magicians that stood in Pharaoh's court and tried to counteract Moses and Aaron. And they could counterfeit some of the miracles, but only there at the very beginning. Until finally, they couldn't duplicate it anymore. And they said to Pharaoh, this is the very finger of God. Did they repent? No. Did they tell Pharaoh to repent? No. Did they tell Pharaoh, you better let the children of Israel go? You're dealing with the real God now. No. They were too complacent, loved their jobs too much, loved their income too much, loved all the stuff that they had in Egypt too much, and they lost it all, as well as their lives, and they're burning in hell today. And they're mentioned by name in the New Testament. Yes, the Antichrist can do miracles. The false prophet can do miracles. We see that here. They can do counterfeit miracles. We're told that by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Satan can empower the Antichrist to perform all kinds of miracles. In fact, duplicates of the miracles of Christ and all the miracles of the work, work by the prophets in both the Old and New Testaments. But the purpose is deception. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. There were false epistles going around, pretending to be from Paul, but contrary to what Paul had written. And apparently somebody had gotten one of those things to the Thessalonians, and they were worried about what they had heard from Paul. There are a lot of false gospels still floating around. There are still some of them extant from ancient times. But they're contrary to Scripture and anything that speaks not according to the law and to the testimony that's because there is no light in them. Paul warns them, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And we told you that that is the word apostasia, from which we get our word apostasy. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist is going to put himself upon a throne in the rebuilt temple, the final temple. Dome of the Rock is going to disappear. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is going to disappear. There's going to be another temple on the Temple Mount. The Jews are going to be all excited and very happy about it. And halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to ascend into that temple and sit on a throne and claim that he's the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. Jesus says, when that happens, you better run for your life. The worst tribulation that the earth has ever seen, that the Jews have ever experienced, is going to happen at that time. It's at the three and a half year mark of the seven years of the tribulation. All these judgments are coming from God on earth. But during that period of time, the Antichrist is consolidating forces. He's building the temple. He's doing all kinds of stuff to show that he's really in control. And, of course, what he is is in rebellion, not in control. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is one of the mysteries, 17 mysteries in the New Testament. Things that were not revealed in the Old Testament, but now are revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
Paul says, even though the church age has now begun, the mystery of iniquity has already started to work. Satan is already trying to get his plan into place. We don't know when it will happen. It could happen at any moment. It could have happened at any moment throughout church history. I think it could happen today. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And then verse 9, this is our key verse. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The three words that are used to describe the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ, except they are lying ones. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Friend, if you're listening in over the internet audience, or if there's somebody here today who's not saved, you have heard the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. And that the only way to be saved is by trusting in him alone to pay for your sins and give you eternal life. You have heard the gospel. It's simple. A child can understand it. If the rapture takes place and the Antichrist takes power, you will not believe the gospel. At that point, it's too late. Because it says so in Scripture. This cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you've heard the gospel and rejected it, and the rapture takes place, you can't say, well, when I see the rapture take place, then I'll believe. No, you won't believe. God himself will send you a strong delusion, and you will believe a lie. and you will be damned for all of eternity. This is serious business, folks. We're not playing church. We're not here today just because it's the cultural thing to do. As you see, the culture around us is not here for the most part. If you follow the cultural things to do, soon you would not be here too. We're here because there is a true and living God in heaven. There's a true and living God who gives eternal life to those who place their faith in him. There's a true and living God who has given us his word so that we might know how to live and how to please Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, to worship him. We closed last week by noting that judgment, fires, and darkness are seen continually throughout the book of Revelation. We saw that there are seven chapters in a row, chapter 14 through 20, that talk about fire and judgment. Chapter 14, which had the power of fire. Chapter 15, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Chapter 16, power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Chapter 17, and burn her with fire. Chapter 18, utterly burned with fire. Chapter 19, his eyes were as a flame of fire. And chapter 20, and they came out up the breadth of the earth and compassed all the camp of the saints about the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Fire is prominent in the book of Revelation. Now let's go back to darkness as it's connected to judgment. We start with new material here this week. God uses darkness to protect believers and to stop the mouths of the wicked. 1 Samuel 2.9 He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. God uses the darkness to protect believers and to stop the mouths of the wicked. That's what he did there in Egypt. God blinds the wicked so that they cannot harm the righteous. Job 5.14 They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. That takes you back to the book of Exodus. There is no return from the darkness of the grave. By the way, these verses, as do many others, disprove so-called spirit mediums. If you've been with us in the evening services about a year ago, I went through a whole series of messages that dealt with witchcraft and the occult and with demonism and sorcerers and witches and magicians and all of that kind of stuff. And those who claim that they are calling back the dead so that you can talk to your great lost uncle someplace. It's a demonic spirit impersonating your great lost uncle. Listen to this. Job 10, verse 21 and 22. 
Before I go whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, a land of darkness as darkness itself and of the shadow of death without any order and where the light is as darkness. He says, I'm going where I will not return. People who claim that they are contacting the dead, spiritist mediums, people who are practicing necromancy according to scripture are worthy of the death penalty. Necromancy is the term for those who contact the dead, or they think they are, or they try to fool people into thinking that they are. Death penalty for that, folks, according to scripture. You don't come back from the dead until the resurrection. Notice something else about those two verses I just read out of Job. Death and darkness are the epitome of entropy. You know, entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. Everything runs downhill, it doesn't run uphill. It's one of the proofs. The two laws of thermodynamics, the law of conservation, the first law, and the law of entropy, the second law, are that no matter can be created, it can only be changed into energy, or energy can be changed into matter, back and forth, but you don't have an increase in either one of them. And entropy is the law that says once it has dissipated, it doesn't come back together again. It's totally contrary to evolution. Death and darkness are described here as the epitome of entropy because all returns to chaos without any order, did you say? And of the shadow of death without any order. And where the light is as darkness. Third lesson. In the darkness of judgment, there is both horrifying physical pain and excruciating mental agony. Back to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 6, Matthew 8, Matthew 22, and Matthew 25. My whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that be in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? Chapter 8, verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not just physical pain. There's going to be mental agony. Chapter 22, 13, And then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 25, verse 30, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you get it? Physical pain, mental agony. Now here's one that I want us to get, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this today. The Shekinah was darkness at the giving of of the law. Let me say it again. The Shekinah was darkness at the giving of the law. Because you see, law and darkness speak of curse and judgment and the impossibility of salvation by works. Law and darkness speak of the curse of judgment and the impossibility of salvation by works. That, friends, is one of the reasons you do not want to be under the law. Let me put the Ten Commandments in their complete context because that's where we see the darkness at the giving of the law. God is speaking from the Shekinah. He says so, and I'll read you some verses that say so. He's speaking from heaven. I'll read you some verses that say so. And yet it is thick darkness. Exodus chapter 20, you all know Exodus 20 is where you find the Ten Commandments. And Deuteronomy chapter 5, you find the Ten Commandments. They're restated for you there. Listen to it, Exodus 20. And God spake all these words, saying, by the way, that is verbal inspiration. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. <laughs> Takes you back to where? The Exodus. The Ten Plagues. He starts by referencing that before he gives the law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. How glad I am that his mercy extends to the thousandth generation, whereas his anger extends only to the third and fourth. 
and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I hope you notice how many verses were given to the Sabbath because we're going to talk about the Sabbath in just a second. <laughs> four verses. And then four words for thou shalt not kill. Five words for thou shalt not commit adultery. Four words thou shalt not steal. Seven, eight words thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And then thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his axe, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Gave a lot to covetousness, too, because you see, covetousness takes you back to the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, because covetousness is idolatry. Paul says so in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. 5. The very next verse, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. You see, the law was given to make you afraid. The law was given as a test that you would fail. And the people stood afar off. Now listen to this. And Moses drew near unto the thick. There's your word again for this darkness that can be felt. The thick darkness where God was. At the giving of the law, the Shekinah. Is thick darkness because the law speaks of judgment. The law speaks of the curse. The law speaks of the impossibility of salvation by works. The thick darkness where God was. Verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you, now get it, that I have talked with you from heaven. Where was God at that moment? In the thick darkness. The thick darkness at the giving of the law. Heaven was darkness. You see, heaven can be both darkness and light. It's different for different people. It burns, but it does not consume. It's a place of blessing. It's a place of judgment. Note something else also. Nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament, but on a different basis. The basis upon which they are restated is our new relationship with Christ. The basis on which they are restated is that the motivation now is our love for Christ, not the fearful consequences of the law. In fact, when all nine are restated, they are restated with greater responsibilities than were ever placed on the people of Israel under the Old Testament law. Did you know that the nine that are restated place more of an obligation on you than was ever placed on national Israel in the Old Testament? Why? Because now we have an empowerment not available to believers in the Old Testament. We have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. You could never, ever possibly keep the law, even in its barest bones form, without the Holy, Holy Spirit indwelling you. Let me give you some examples. What did the Old Testament say? What did it say about murder? Four words, Exodus 20, 13, thou shalt not kill. That becomes in the New Testament a far greater obligation and danger, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard it said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Jesus is quoting the Ten Commandments. 
and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Did Jesus just expand on thou shalt not kill? I think he did. Suddenly there's a greater obligation. Suddenly there's a greater danger. Suddenly there's a greater point of fear if you don't understand what's going on. How about adultery? Five words in the Old Testament, Exodus 20, 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That becomes a far greater obligation and danger in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by then of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's quoting the seventh commandment. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Mental adultery is just as serious in the eyes of God as physical adultery. Now, I know nobody gets pregnant by that. But did you know God judges it the same way? How about theft? Four words in the Old Testament, verse 15 of Exodus 20, thou shalt not steal. It becomes a far greater obligation and danger. And listen to the responsibilities that suddenly you have. Ephesians 4.28 Let him that stole steal no more. Thou shalt not steal. No, stop stealing, guys. I think everybody in this room, including me at some point or another, has stolen something. I can remember as a kid. It still is burned into my conscience. Trying to pick up something in the grocery store, a piece of candy or something, in the checkout line and putting it in my pocket and my dad saw me and he made me pull it out and put it up on the counter in front of the clerk. I've never been more embarrassed in my entire life. I tell you, that taught me something. Don't steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Walked off with something that wasn't yours? Walked off with it accidentally and then later thought, oh, this isn't mine, but I got it now. <laughs> and went ahead and kept it. Let him the soul steal no more. But listen to the new obligation. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. There are four additional obligations that were not placed on Israel under the law. The ceiling is contrasted with working. You're obligated to work. And then secondly, you're obligated to work a righteous type of work. Uh, you can't be a disco dancer or a strip teaser in a bar. With his hands, the thing which is good. And then you have to be able to do something with the money that you earn from that, that he may have to give. Hmm. Thou shalt not steal in the Old Testament suddenly took on a whole bunch of new meanings in the New Testament where suddenly our relationship to Christ changes everything about the way in which we live. That he may have to give and not just give Christmas presents to your friends who are going to give you something back. To somebody who can't repay you. That he may have to give to him that needeth. Yeah, nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament, but it's because of a new relationship with Christ. It's because of a new empowerment by the Holy Spirit that enables you to do what you could never do in the flesh under the law. The law only condemns you. The law cannot save you. The law is not a matter of working your way to heaven. It's a proof that you need Christ, who has paid the full penalty of the law. And that's why you can be saved. You can't pay for your sins. You've already committed them. You've already broken the law. The wages of sin is death. You break one command, you've broken them all according to James chapter 2, verse 10. You have a mighty, powerful chain. You break one link, you've broken the chain. You don't have to break every link to break the chain. The only commandment that is not restated as required of believers today is the Sabbath. It was specifically given to national Israel 
as a sign between God and Israel. Now, we've already done an extensive study on God's continuing promises to national Israel that guarantees future fulfillment, so I won't go all of that stuff here right now. But let me remind you of just one thing. Those who confuse Israel and the church tend to place believers back under the law, including the law of the Sabbath. Sadly, there are many in the Reformed camp who won't even cook on Sunday, which they claim is the Christian Sabbath, because they would have to light a fire which was prohibited under Old Testament Sabbath law. So they eat cold cuts. You know, it was prohibited. Exodus 35.3. Have you ever lit, enough, lit a fire on Sunday thinking that Sunday was the Sabbath? Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Ever lighted your stove? Now, I know most stoves have a piazza lighter in them now, you know, or a pilot light. <laughs> so you just turn it on, it just makes the flame a little bit bigger. You're going to get around it that way, right? <laughs> Getting around the law. That's what the Jews do with their 613 hedges about the law. Dear friends, I can remember hearing a radio preacher. He's still on the radio today. He's up in North Jersey. He's a Reformed Baptist. I won't tell you his name. But preaching on the radio, do you watch television on Sunday? Sabbath breaker! Do you read the newspaper on Sunday? Sabbath breaker! I thought, where in the world is that in the Bible? Dear people, if you confuse Israel and the church, you will end up putting the church back under the law. The Bible never changes the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday anywhere. The Sabbath is always, always, every place it's mentioned in the entire Bible, it is always the seventh day of the week, and it is never the first day of the week unless it's one of the high holy days, which were also counted Sabbaths, that happen in the Jewish calendar to fall on a Sunday. But the weekly Sabbath is always, there is not one illustration in the entire Bible where the Sabbath is not the seventh day of the week, unless you're talking about one of the high holy days, which many of them can come bunk, 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 bunk right next to each other. It's always the seventh day of the week. It's always Saturday, what we call Saturday. There's no place that the Bible changes the so-called Christian Sabbath, to Sunday. Did you know something else? Not only was the Sabbath given only to Israel and not to the other nations, in fact, the Sabbath law was the one thing that God pulled out of the Ten Commandments to emphatically comment on, both in our text there in Exodus chapter 20 and also in Deuteronomy 5, the one thing that he emphatically commented on to include the death penalty. And he says it at the end of the giving of the law. Exodus 31, verse 14. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul should be cut off from among his people. Verse 15. Six days may that work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Verse 16. He says this over and over again. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. To and he says, who it is, the children of Israel, you are not the children of Israel, shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Do you get it? The Sabbath is between God and the children of Israel. Verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him, upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. The thing that God pulls out to emphasize is the Sabbath and the death penalty for breaking it. If you transfer the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday and put Christians back under Sabbath law, you can't take part of it. You take the entire thing. Who gives you the right to leave out part of it 
and just take the parts that you like to sort of manipulate and control the church and make them legalistic so that the world sneers at them. You break the Sabbath? Is Sunday the Sabbath? When you get in your car and turn on the engine, do you light a fire? You sure do. You know, they found a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. They said, what in the world are we going to do with this guy? They put him in hold. They asked the Lord. God said, kill him. You ever picked up a stick on Sunday? Dear people, when the law was given, God spoke to Moses out of the thick darkness. And it caused terror in the hearts of the people. And it says God spoke to him from heaven. Because the law was designed for judgment. The law was designed to prove you're a sinner. The law was to show you're without hope and cannot work your way to salvation. The law was given to condemn you. But the grace of God reached down to you in the person of Christ who paid the penalty of the law for your sins. He died on Calvary's cross. And there was thick darkness over all the earth. God was judging your sin and mine. The relationship of the Sabbath to national Israel, both again in Leviticus and Numbers. I must stop quickly here. Leviticus 24, 8. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. It's a covenant with Israel. Numbers 15, 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness have found a man that gathered six upon the Sabbath day, and of course they stoned him. If we're under the Sabbath law, there's a death penalty for breaking the Sabbath. You cannot take part of the Sabbath and ignore the rest. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, and yet offend in one point, listen to the last five words. He is guilty of all. Do you understand why you don't want to be under the law? Do you understand what the grace of God has done for you in freeing you from the chains of the law? Oh, we have obligations to live righteous and holy lives before God. And nine of the Ten Commandments are restated, but not on the basis of Mount Sinai, on the basis of our new relationship with Christ. And it's a relationship motivated by love. We love Him because He first loved us. And when you really love somebody, when you really love them, you don't want to do anything that would hurt them. We haven't gotten off our subject. We're still talking about the plague of darkness. And I had thought this would be the last week on it. But I'm sorry I got carried away from my notes and started preaching. <laughs> so we'll pick it up there next week, the Lord willing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. And how we thank you that we've been freed from the curse of the law. For cursed is everyone who continues not to do all the things that are therein. And yet Christ has been made a curse for us. He has borne the weight of the law for our sins. He died in our place. Because all the sins that we've committed and that we'll ever commit and he did it because he loves us. He chose us for his bride he took the bullet for us so that we might live. It makes me weep. 
that my sins nailed Jesus to the cross at Calvary. And what motivation it gives to me for wanting to live a holy life. A life of purity and righteousness. A life pleasing to the one that I'll see someday who loves me in spite of myself. The one from whose lips I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number...